All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. And um, thank you for accommodating one more of these virtual uh, seminars. Um, I thought I would spend my time today presenting a pair of new tools for compressing uh, probability distribution more effectively than IID sampling and or standard thinning. And this is joint work with a number of excellent collaborators, which I've, who, have list, who have listed here. So the motivation for this whole line of work is coming from the field of computational cardiology, where um, scientists are developing these digital twins of human hearts. And the goal is to be able to predict disease progression and predict therapy response in a non-invasive way by essentially simulating your heart. And this is necessarily a multi-scale problem because we're interested in whole heart phenomena, but to understand those phenomena, we need to understand what's going on at even the single scale level. So for example, if you want to understand a heartbeat, that's clearly a, you know, a whole organ phenomenon, but it's coordinated by calcium signaling in your heart cells. And it's known that dysregulation of that calcium signaling can lead to life-threatening heart arrhythmias. Um, and so this, so there are whole lines of work which are, which are focused on simply modeling the impact of this calcium signaling dysregulation on heart function. And so let's take a look at what the ideal inferential pipeline looks like if you're studying the impact of calcium signaling on heart function. Well, first, we don't actually know how calcium signaling works, but we can model it and we have pretty good models, but those models have unknown parameters. And so we need to estimate those parameters and we do that using patient data. Okay, so now we're doing estimation, that means we have uncertainty. And so we'd like to capture that uncertainty. And a typical way of doing that is by sampling many likely parameter configurations for your model. Standard procedure is to run Markov chain Monte Carlo, MCMC, to eventually draw sample points from the uh, posterior distribution, I'll call that P, over your unknown parameters in your calcium signaling model. Now for this sort of, for this sort of model, uh, typical posterior, in this case is a 38 dimensional posterior, you're trying to learn 38 parameters. Um, this may require millions of sample points simply to adequately explore your target distribution using MCMC. Okay, so now we understand the uncertainty of calcium signaling, but what we really care about is the heart. And so what you want to do is you want to propagate that uncertainty through your whole heart simulator so that you can understand uncertainty about outcomes of your heart, you know, uncertainty about arrhythmias. And this is where things get expensive because each of these whole heart simulations costs today thousands of CPU hours. And so simulating this with millions of different configurations is prohibitive. And so this is leading to the main questions of our talk. First, can we accurately summarize a distribution P using many fewer points? Instead of a million, can we knock that down to say a thousand? And you know, how do we do that? So I'd say that these, these questions are also at the, at the, the heart of the field of, distrib the, you know, of distribution compression, where the goal is to accurately summarize a probability distribution using a small number of points. And I imagine that most here are already familiar with standard solutions to this problem. The most common solutions are simply to directly sample from P. So I could sample IID from P. That gives me a compression of the distribution. Or I could, in the cases where direct sampling is infeasible, I could use Markov chain Monte Carlo with a Markov chain that's converging to P. The benefits of these approaches are that they're readily available. You know, we have MCMC algorithms that are applicable for lots of target distributions, and they're eventually high quality in the sense that if I want to approximate an intractable integral, an intractable expectation under P, I can do so um, in, an in an asymptotically exact way by just taking a sample average over the points that I've drawn. So eventually these are gonna to converge to the estimates that I want. But there's also a drawback. And the main drawback I wanna focus on here is that the samples produced are far too large. So your typical integration error is only one over square root N, which means that to get a 1% reduction in your error, you need 10,000 points. And this is gonna be prohibitive for these expensive downstream tasks like simulating your heart and other expensive function evaluations. So what can we do? Well, 
One idea is since, since these standard solutions are readily available, what if we make use of them? But instead of using them directly for our downstream tasks, let's compress them. Let's directly compress the high quality sample approximations that we already have. I'll call it the empirical distribution of, over that sample approximation, PN. So it's, let's directly compress that PN. And essentially what I'm doing here is just reducing the general problem of distribution compression to one of impress, compressing an empirical distribution. All right, so then how do we do that? How do we effectively compress an empirical distribution? Well, you could reach for the same source of solutions. You could use uniform subsampling. You could do IID sampling. Um, in, in MCMC, a common practice is really, is called standard thinning. It's just to keep every teeth point. So you might end up with just the red points instead of the gray points on the left. Um, the drawback of either of these solutions is that you get this large loss in accuracy. So your worst case integration error is gonna go, go up by a factor of square root T. And so if you wanted to do heavy compression from N points down to square root N, this means your error is going from N to the minus one half all the way up to N to the minus one quarter. So that's a pretty big error loss. So you might ask like, can we actually do better than that? And for that, I think it's helpful to look at the lower bounds for this problem. So there actually are some minimax lower bounds known for worst case integration error to P. And what do we know? Well, first we know that any, any procedure that's going to return square root n points has to suffer um, square root one over square root n error for some target distribution. So, okay, n to the minus one half is as, as well as we can do. And then separately, any approximation to p at all of any form that's based only on n iid input points has to have at least n to the minus one half error. So that's good. I mean, both of these bounds are pointing us to the same number or the same, you know, rate, n to the minus one half. And there's also a pretty big gap between n to the minus one half, which is actually what the error of Pn was to begin with. You know, our starting sample already had n to the minus one half error. There's a pretty big gap between n to the minus one half and n to the minus one quarter that we get from standard thinning. So that's hopeful. And in this talk, what I want to do is introduce a more effective compression strategy, I'll call it kernel thinning, that matches these lower bounds up to log factors. Okay, so this is our problem setup. Uh, we'll be given a sequence of input points. I'll call that S in. That, those are the points X1 through Xn. They're gonna be in R to the D. And I'm gonna call it the empirical distribution over those points Pn. Uh, now, I'm not gonna say a lot about where these points came from. They could be coming from IID sampling. They could be from MCMC but really they actually could be pre-generated by any algorithm. You could use quadrature, you could use kernel thinning, you could use your favorite input algorithm. I just want them to be, to represent a good approximation to P, to the target distribution P. Okay, and then we also have a target output size S. So you should think of S as basically square root N if we're trying to do very heavy compression. And my goal is to return a core set, S out, which is a subset of the input points that has S elements in it. And you know, I have some I have some goals for this core set. And so I'll call the empirical distribution over that core set Q. And my goal is that this core set will have better than IID integration error between Pn and Q. So I want a, I want a better than IID approximation to Pn. And this mean and this translates into a little o of s to the minus one half, because s to the minus one half is what IID sampling will give us. Okay. So First, we need, a, we, need to, we need a measure of quality. To even quantify this, we need a measure of quality. Given this goal of um, having small integration error between Pn and Q, I think it's natural to consider as a quality measure a maximum mean discrepancy, or MMD for short, because this measures the maximum discrepancy between input and core set expectations over some class of real value test functions. Specifically, we're focusing on unit balls of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So these MMDs are going to be parameterized by reproducing kernel K. That's just any, it's a function of two arguments that's symmetric in those two arguments and also positive semi-definite, meaning that if I take N points and I form the, the matrix of pairwise evaluations, then that matrix is always a positive semi-definite matrix. So here are a couple of, here are a couple of pretty common examples. So probably the most common is what you might call a Gaussian kernel. It looks like a Gaussian density apply to the difference between X and Y, the two arguments. 
And here's a second called the inverse multiquadric, which will rear its head again later in the talk. And you know, if you pick your kernel in the right way, and you know, a lot of common kernels satisfy this property, then this MMD actually metrizes convergence and distribution, which means that control over the MMD is actually going to give you control over um, integration error for any bounded continuous function. And this is true for lots of popular kernels like the Gaussian, Matern, B spline, inverse multiquadric, et cetera. Okay, and so for to present the algorithm, I need one additional element, and it's what I like to call a square root kernel. And a square root kernel is just another kernel that when you integrate it against itself, it gives you back your original kernel. And it turns out you can identify these for lots of standard kernels. So for instance, if your kernel is a Gaussian, if K is a Gaussian, a square root kernel is also a Gaussian. It's just a Gaussian with um, a slightly diminished bandwidth. Um, if your kernel is a matern, then your square root kernel is also a matern with a, with a different parameter. And if it's a B spline, it's another B spline. So you can actually derive these for lots of standard kernels pretty easily, but for what I'm about to tell you, you don't actually need access to an exact square root kernel. You just need it to be the case that when you integrate the kernel against itself, it generates a reproducing kernel Hilbert space that contains your original kernel. And so we have some examples of uh, convenient choices for other kernels in our paper. Okay, so now I have, we have enough information to, to share this algorithm with you. So here's an algorithm for compression. It's called kernel thinning. It has two stages. The first stage I like to think of as an initial, a good initialization stage. We call it KT split. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your input point set and you're going to partition it into two to the M balanced candidate core sets, each of size N over two to the M. All right, so I just divide it up to two to the M sets. Um, so when, when M is equal to you know, one half log N, then you're going to get square root n core sets of size square root n. So this, you know, the size n over two to the m is the s that we've been carrying around. All right, but you can think of the you can think of square root n core sets of size square root n. Then once you have those once you have those candidates, we're going to do some refinement. This is the second stage. We call it KT swap. First, you're just going to pick the candidate that's closest to your input set in terms of your MMD, and then you're going to iteratively refine that candidate by kicking out points and replacing them with input points that lead to better MMD. And you're gonna do that, you're gonna do one pass through your core set to refine it. And that's it, that's the algorithm. I'll go into a little bit more detail, but first I'll just say a few, I'll give you uh, a few facts about it. First, the total running time of the algorithm is dominated by N squared kernel evaluations. So it becomes an N squared time algorithm. And the space is the minimum, the space that you need is a minimum of ND and N squared depending on whether you just want to store your data set or whether you want to store the entire kernel matrix, the matrix of pairwise evaluations. Okay, now I've told you everything you really need to know about step two already, but I want to dig into a bit more about step one, KT split. So here's a cartoon. Um, the way we do the partitioning, so I said I'm, gener I'm taking our input set S in, I'm dividing it into two to the M candidate core sets. I do that via iterative halving. So first I split it into two halves, split those two halves into two quarters, and so on until I get down to my target size. Now, if we, if we consider each of these candidate output sets, we'll call them SM1 up through SM2 to the M, we can unpack what's going on to construct it. Oh, and just before I say that, I also, I also want to highlight that the algorithm actually also runs online. So um, after you've processed I input points, you now you have um, output core sets of size i over two to the m. So you could do this in a streaming fashion and stop when you want instead of fixing n ahead of time. Okay, so each of these output core sets I was saying is the result of what you might call repeated kernel halving. Um, at every step, you take all your remaining points, you pair them up arbitrarily, but we usually just do them sequentially. And then from each point, from each pair of points, you're going to choose one that's going to be kept in your core set and the other one's going to be discarded. And you choose amongst these two points, not, um, not uniformly at random, but you're using some non-uniform randomness that biases toward the better choice. And this is how you start to achieve balance across your core sets. Um, and this is what's going to give us uh, these gains in terms of approximation error. And this is using a generalization of this beautiful algorithm due to uh, Aylweiss, Liu, and Sani called the self-balancing walk. 
So this is what it looks like. We, we call the generalization a self-balancing Hilbert walk. Here's the algorithm in its full glory, but I just want you to focus in on the first and last lines for now. The algorithm is going to take in a sequence of functions in a Hilbert space, and it's going to output a signed sum of those functions. So it's going to output a sum of those functions. I want to give every function a sign, a to i, which is either plus one or minus one. Okay, so why am I doing this? What does this have to do with our problem? Well, first of all, this allows us to get a halving of our input set. So if we start with endpoints, I pair them up, I, I, met, I make each of these functions equal to the difference in kernel evaluations, the difference in kernel functions evaluated at two sequential points. I make that choice because since I'm assigning a sign to every fi, those signs are going to, in the end, half of my points are going to have sign plus one, half of them are going to have sign minus one, and the ones that have sign plus one are going to be my core set. Those are going to be the half that I choose for my core set. All right, so the points that end up with sign one are going to be called s out. That's my halved core set. And with this perspective, you, can, you, you find that the output of this algorithm is really just the difference in kernel means between my input points and my new core set, my new output core set. So that's useful. That's useful because on top of giving us a halving, this algorithm is also going to achieve um, balance. And by balance, I mean this, this difference in kernel means evaluated at any point x tends to be small. So the discrepancy between the kernel means tends to be small at every point. And explicitly what I mean by small is that this value is going to be sub-Gaussian, and it's going to be sub-Gaussian with a sub-Gaussian constant that's square root log n over n. For now, for comparison, if I had just used iid signs, then the object, the object would also be sub-Gaussian, but it would have, have size 1 over square root n. So that's a pretty big difference. You know, we're getting basically a, a 1 over square root n improvement. Um, and how is this achieved? Well, we are using randomness to pick the signs, but instead of um, picking uniformly at random, essentially what you do is you check. First, you try adding your, you try adding your vector to your sum, to your sign sum, and you see which direction tends to make the sum smaller. And then you choose, you choose a random direction, but bias toward the better, bias toward the better choice. Okay. So now one thing I didn't mention is that when I choose these functions, I'm not using the base kernel, I'm not using the target kernel that I'm um, trying to minimize the MMD of, I'm using the square root kernel. And so you might wonder, why am I using a square root kernel? Like, what, what does that have to do with anything? Um, and there's a, there's a good reason for this. And it's that you can bound the MMD for your target kernel K in terms of the L infinity error for your square root kernel, K root. And by L infinity error, I just mean the worst case deviation between the kernel means between the PN and Q kernel means. So here's the explicit result. It says, if I want to bound MMD on the left-hand side for my target kernel K, then it's really upper bounded by the L infinity error plus some other stuff. Uh, what's this other stuff? Um, these taus that I've written here represent quantities that depend on the tail decay of your distributions of your PN and Q and also of your, um, of your kernel itself uh, of, of K root. And there's this parameter R here that's trading off between the L infinity error term and these tail decay terms. I'll call, that the, I'll call that R the effective radius. And basically, you just want to choose R so that these tail decay parameters are all about the target error that you're looking for, which in our case is 1 over square root n. And that means that if you're dealing with compactly supported distributions, you can just choose R to be a constant. Um, if you're dealing with distributions that have sub-exponential decay, you typically want R to be about log n. But OK, and that's a lot. So let's just say, let's focus in on a particular case that's easy to interpret. In the, if you're thinking about the compactly supported case, and this bound basically just says, the MMD for K is bounded by the L infinity error for K root. And so if I can control the L infinity error for K root, then I can get a good bound for, it, for um, the MMD. And that's why we've introduced this square root kernel. OK. So how do we do that? How do we bound that L infinity error? Well, we already saw from that self-balancing Hilbert walk algorithm that the discrepancy is already controlled. You know, for every, for every, at every point x, the discrepancy is small, and we just want the worst case discrepancy over all x. 
And so we can, we're gonna achieve this basically just using union bounds, chaining, um, standard things. And so here's a theorem that says, if you just run one round of kernel halving, you'll get out a core set Q that has half the size, that's it's too thin. And the L infinity error of that is basically two over N times this quantity, times this inflation factor, which I'll call M. And you should think of M as square root log N if you're dealing with compactly supported distributions or at most log N in general. Okay, so this is, so two thing, you get two over N error times square root log N. That's great. Now, of course, we're not just interested in having, we'd like to get down to smaller amounts of, uh, you know, smaller core sets. And so to do that, we're just going to recursively repeat the same operation. We have, and then we have again, and we have again. So if you do repeated kernel halving, you'll get a two over two to the M thin core set, and you get basically the same sort of error. This is saying this quantity two to the M over N is the same as saying one over the output size. So your error is one over the output size times the same inflation factor, which is either square root log N or log N. Okay, so if we're thinking about the heavy compression case where we're trying to compress down to square root N points, then the result is that your L infinity error is at most log N over square root N. Meanwhile, the L infinity error for IID sampling would be N to the minus one quarter. You know, this much larger quantity that we're trying to avoid. In addition, some recent work by Phillips and Tai shows us that this is pretty close to optimal. We know that any procedure that outputs square root endpoints has to suffer at least n to the minus one half L infinity error. So this is, you know, optimal up to that log n factor. All right. So what is it, what are the, what's the implication for MMD? Well, we have the L infinity bound and we just need to plug it into that old theorem that I showed you. So for instance, if you're in the compactly supported case, the conclusion you get from MMD is that the MMD for your target kernel K is also bounded by square root log N over N. More generally, if you have sub Gaussian tails or sub exponential tails, you're gonna get a hit with some additional log N to the D over four powers, depending on the actual tail decay. And those guarantees start to look a lot like the classical quasi Monte Carlo guarantees, which tell us, you know, quasi Monte Carlo was also developed to do better than IID um, quadrature. And those bounds say you get log n to the d over square root n error. And this is similar to the sorts of bounds we're getting here. The main difference I want to highlight is that quasi Monte Carlo is focused on the uniform distribution on the unit cube. And here we're trying to develop a strategy that will work for more general target distributions on r to the d. And everything I'm presenting today is going to be in terms of big O, but if, if you want to see not explicit non-asymptotic bounds, uh, take a look at our paper. Okay, so it's worth mentioning some related work in this space, um, in particular for the uniform distribution P on, on the unit cube. I mentioned that quasi Monte Carlo gives you log N to the D over square root N MMD. So this is you know, better than IID. Um, it actually establishes this for something called the L2 discrepancy, but that turns out that's just a special type of MMD for the particular kernel. There's also a recent strategy called the online horror strategy, which gives similar guarantees um, in a different manner. But both of these, both of these I would say satisfy our goals, but they're focused, they're exploiting the specific symmetries of the uniform distribution. And we want something a bit more generic. For more general P, a number, there are a number of strategies you could use to get um, MMD core sets. We already mentioned you could, just, you could just do IID sampling. You could use Markov chain Monte Carlo. It turns out if your Markov chain is sufficiently ergodic, then you'll get N to the minus one quarter MMD, which is just the IID rate, but that's the rate that we're trying to improve upon. There are also a number of other algorithms that have been developed to improve upon this rate. Um, one is called kernel herding. There's Stein points MCMC. No, there's called greedy sign selection, but none of these are known to have better than n to the minus one quarter uh, MMD rates uh, for the sorts of infinite dimensional kernels that we're interested in here. Now there have been improvements for finite dimensional kernels, like linear kernels on R to the D. Um, one great example is the discrepancy construction of Harvey and Samadhi that leads to a, a rather large improvement in, um, in MMD quality but doesn't extend to infinite dimensional kernels. 
like the Gaussian and Matern sorts of kernels that I mentioned earlier. And then there are also a number of other procedures that work very well in practice, but with, un, with basically unknown core set quality. So one good example is super sampling with the reservoir where the core set quality hasn't been analyzed. Another great one is su the support points um, from Mac and Joseph. In that paper, they actually establish, so they're working with a particular MMD called the energy distance. They establish that the best core set of size square root n has better than IID rate for MMD, but don't provide a construction for that best core set. Instead, they provide a, a, a practical procedure that seems to work very well in practice, but don't actually analyze that procedure or show it to be uh, optimal. Now, I mentioned a little bit about guarantees for L-infinity error. So I just want to mention some related work on L-infinity core sets as well. Um, there have actually been a series of breakthroughs on this problem over the past decade, um, due to Joshi et al., Phillips et al., Phillips and Tai Tai, which, which have been providing increasingly higher quality um, L-infinity error core sets that are better than IID. Uh, the best known L-infinity guarantees are due to Phillips and Tai, they um, basically get square root log n over square root n error. Um, but the algorithms run in, you know, using standard matrix multiplication, they run in n to the fourth time and use n squared space. Tai also has a refinement of this specifically for the Gaussian kernel, which takes that log square root log n and turns it into square root log log n, but at the cost of um, d to the d runtime. So it's really targeted at very small dimensions. And both of these algorithms are run offline and require rebalancing after um, doing some approximate halving steps, so not doing exact halving. So just for comparison, the algorithm I showed you has a larger um, inflation factor, log n instead of squared log n, but runs only in n squared time relative, relative to like n to the fourth and nd space and is online and uses exact halving. And it turns out that depending on the, the, the nature of your kernel and your distribution, that log n actually can be reduced. So if you're dealing with compact support, then you get square root log n back matching the Phillips and tie guarantee. And if it's sub-Gaussian, then it's, you know, it's only inflated by a log log n factor. Okay, so let's take a look at this in practice. First, I'm gonna show you some simple examples just to highlight some, some basic properties of kernel thinning versus IID sampling. So here my target is a mixture of Gaussians, uh, four components. I'm either going to sample IID or I'm going to sample the same number of points using kernel thinning. Um, and roughly what you see is that using kernel thinning instead of just IID sampling, you get better stratification across your components. You know, here, same number of points in each of, near each of my modes, and then less clumping and fewer gaps within components. And you see this even for very small sample sizes, right? Even here, I, must, I only have 16 points, or I have eight points, actually. I only have eight points here. And you still see this, this nice balance being achieved. And I think this becomes even more apparent when you move to larger numbers of components. Here, I have eight components in that. My, here are my first eight points from kernel thinning versus IID sampling. And IID sampling, just because of the randomness, tends to like oversample and undersample some modes. Um, but you get much better stratification using this, uh, using KT. And the same phenomenon um, is reflected if you actually measure the MMD error. So here I'm actually computing, since I'm using a mixture of Gaussian's target uh, and a Gaussian kernel, I can actually exactly compute the MMD between my point sets and the target distribution. And here I'm just plotting the error as a function of core set size. And basically what you see is that by using kernel thinning, you can improve the rate of decay and the order of magnitude of your, of your MMD. And you're seeing gains even for very small sample sizes. So even with four points, you're seeing separation between IID and, um, and KT. And here I'm just varying the number of components in my mixture. So four component mixture, six component, eight component. Okay, and now what happens as you move into higher dimensions? So here, previously I was looking at these two-dimensional mixtures of Gaussians. What happens in higher dimensions? Well, let's see. Um, here I'm just using a standard Gaussian target, but I'm arranging the, having the dimension range from two up to 100. 
And what, you can, what we find is that even for very small sample sizes in these higher dimensions, so I actually here, I have only four points, eight points in dimension 100, but we are still seeing, you still see improvements both in the rate of decay and order of magnitude, even for high dimensions. So, you know, I said, we're, improve, we're achieving the rate up to log factors. And so you might imagine, well, log factors are great when n is big, but might hurt you when n is small. But we actually see gains even when n is small. Okay, so now let's look at MCMC. Um, we're gonna be, I'll look at a few different posterior inference problems. Each one involves the parameters from um, a system of ordinary differential equations. And the, and the target P is gonna be the posterior of those parameters given, given some observed data. And we're gonna look at three different models. Um, there's the Goodwin model of, of enzymatic control. It's a four-dimensional posterior. There's the Latka Volterra model of predator prey evolution, another four-dimensional posterior. And then there's this Hinch model of the cardiac calcium signaling that I mentioned to you earlier, which is this 38-dimensional 30, posterior. And remember now, the goal, the downstream goal here is to propagate our model uncertainty through a whole heart simulation. And so really every sample point that we're discarding is valuable because it's, it represents thousands of CPU hours that are saved and not having to simulate that for that primary configuration. All right, and we're also gonna explore a few different markup chains, four different ones, Gaussian random walk, um, an adaptive random walk, a metropolis adjusted Landman algorithm, and a preconditioned MALA algorithm. And just to give you some, some context, for the, for the Hinch model, it took about two weeks of CPU time just to generate the markup chain, out, the MCMC algorithm. So we generated a chain of length 4 million, it took two weeks to generate it, and then again, the downstream costs um, are gonna be even greater when we, uh, when we have to simulate the heart. And so both of these times basically dwarf the cost of doing the, the thinning itself. All right, so let's just jump into the results here. I'm showing these same sorts of MMD plots um, for on the top row, four different Markov chains for the Goodwin model, four different Markov chains for the Lotka Volterra model. For the Hinch model, I'm showing you two different independent runs of the same Markov chain, and then two different independent runs of a tempered version of the Hinch posterior. And what do we see? Well, basically we see that KT is improving our rate of decay, it's improving the magnitude of our MMD. And it's doing this, you know, we see, you know, in these top two examples, standard thinning is like pretty bad, like as we expected, as it, as it can be in the worst case. But in the bottom example, actually standard thinning already is pretty good. We're actually seeing, you know, better than IID rates of decay. But even in those cases, we're still improving um, our approximation equality, which translates also into reducing our size. So for instance, we, we save, you know, this, Moving from this red, this red triangle to this blue dot represents a factor of two. So that's having the dataset size for the same quality, which is great when you need, when every point is count, counting for a thousand CPU hours. Okay, so it seems like that should be the end of the story. Goals are all achieved and we can all go home. But there's actually something wrong here. There's something that you can't tell just from those plots. And there's something wrong is that. These hinged Markov chains, like the first two pairs of Markov chains, the good, Goodwin and Laca Volterra, they've all mixed well. I can verify that. You can, you know, you can check with me afterward if you, you don't believe me. But these hinged Markov chains actually haven't mixed. And how do I know that? Well, I said I ran two different um, independent copies of my Markov chain. So here I'm showing you the um, marginal distributions from those two copies of the Markov chain. Remember, these are both supposed to be approximating the same distribution, but they're marginals aren't even overlapping in most of the cases. They're just, you know, they're not, yeah, they're not even overlapping, which means they're basically these two chains have gotten stuck into like two different local modes. And so I can't trust that these chains have mixed. And so what can we do about that? Well, a typical solution for this sort of thing is to instead use a more diffuse tempered posterior for faster mixing. So instead of targeting P, I can target some P tilde that's more diffuse and hence allows for a more rapid um, exploration of the, of the distribution. So we can do that and we will do that, but this is gonna introduce a problem for us. It's gonna create a persistent bias because these, the MCMC points that summarize the tempered posterior are summarizing the wrong distribution. 
they're summarizing some p tilde instead of p. So here's the question for the remainder of the talk, actually, can we correct for such biases while we're doing compression? And, you know, this is a more general, this sort of goal, um, this is a more general goal. And this would be useful in other cases too, if we could, because, you know, we would get biases if we're doing tempering and that comes up all the time, but you may be doing some other sort of off-target sam sampling. For instance, you might be using an approximate Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm because it's more convenient, but it's not actually converging to your target. So there's a persistent bias. And you also even get bias just from things like burn-in. When I started my Markov chain, to approximate this posterior, I started it somewhere over here. And so it had to find its way over to the, the region of high density. And then it was mi mixing around in that region of high density. But this long tail to the side has nothing to do with the target distribution. It's just, it has to do with the process of getting to the target. And ideally I would want to discard all these points because they have, they have little to do with my target. And so it's another sort of bias that you like, you'd like to get rid of automatically when you're doing compression. So the problem, the difficulty here is that to do this, to get to correct for these biases, you can't just look at the output of your Markov chain. You need more information about your target distribution. You need to be somehow, somehow to measure distance to your target distribution, the true target P. And so for this, we're going to revisit our quality measure. So we've been using these maximum mean discrepancies to measure quality, but previously we were measuring MMD to PN, which is our surrogate for P. Now let's try to measure it directly to P. And it's helpful to note that you can rewrite your MMD in this nice closed form with this nice closed form expression, which says that the MMD is just a function of the expectations of your kernel function under P and Q. So that's helpful. And then particularly helpful because it tells us why it's hard to use, to compute an MMD or to use it in any way. Um, and the difficulty is that if, you, if you're doing MCMC, um, integration under P is already is difficult. You don't know how to integrate under P typically, which means that you probably don't know what PK is. You can't compute that. And you probably can't compute your MMD either. Uh, and, and indeed, this is difficult in practice for most kernels, most kernels and most target distributions. So how can we get around this? Well, one idea is to use kernels, to consider kernels that are known a priori to be mean zero under your target distribution. If we could find such a kernel, then that would get rid of all these PK terms. And then I would just have a function that depends only on Q. And then that's something that I can potentially compute because Q is just a discrete distribution. So I can always compute that. Okay, so that's the idea. How do we find such a kernel? Well, um, these, this is exactly the motivation for what's called a kernel Stein discrepancy. A kernel Stein discrepancy, it turns out, is just a special type of MMD with a kernel that's specifically constructed to be mean zero under your target. This, and it's, you know, these, these have been proposed and developed simultaneously by several different groups. Um, and this is the form of these special kernels. We'll call these kernels KP. The way, you, the way you derive it is first you take your favorite input kernel K and you pass it through an operator twice. You, the operator does something to the X argument and does something to the Y argument. Specifically, it involves the density, but it only involves the density. Um, it only depends on the density through the gradient of its log density. It's hard to see from this expression, but in particular, you don't have to know the normalizing constant of your density to compute this kernel, which is great because that's, we typically don't um, for these MCMC applications. Okay, so good. Um, it's computable when your normalization constant is unknown. And under pretty mild conditions, you know, if you're if the gradient of your log density, so if you have a log density, it's differentiable, and the gradient of that log density is integrable, then this kernel will be mean zero under P. All right, so you're you are inputting some information about P. It's coming from the gradient of the log density, but that's the same sort of information that you're using for standard MCMC algorithms like Langevin, you know, Metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Okay, so this is good. So the main takeaway from this is that here we, can ha we have a discrepancy measure that we can actually compute that's measuring error directly to P instead of to PN, that surrogate. And so we're gonna use that to do bias correction. And how are we gonna do that? Well, well first I just, uh, I'll just highlight one more property about the, the KSD. Um, I mentioned before that if you pick a, you know, 
one of these nice universal kernels, then your MMD will control convergence and distribution. It turns out that this is also true for kernel Stein discrepancies if you pick your kernels correctly. So if you use um, one of these inverse multi-quadric base kernels for K, and you pass that through your Stein operator to get out your KP, then whenever your target density has strongly log concave tails, so it need not be strongly log concave, it can be actually be multimodal, um, but the tails have to be strongly log concave, and your grad log P is Lipschitz, then um, whenever um, your MMD goes to zero, you can be assured that your sample approximation is converging to P. So you control weak convergence. Okay, so what are we gonna do with this kernel Stein discrepancy? Well, we're gonna do something we like to call Stein thinning. Um, by the way, when I say Stein here, this is all an homage to um, uh, Charles Stein. Um, and there's some deep connections to Stein's method here, which I'm happy to talk with you about at, at any point in the future. But what are we gonna do? We're gonna, we're going to just take this KSD and we're just going to greedily minimize it, but we're only going to use points from our, our input set. We're only gonna choose points from our input set, which actually makes the minimization easy to do. So first we start out with no points. We pick the single point that leads to the best approximation to P in terms of the KSD. We'll call that Y1. And then on every subsequent step, we're just gonna add in a new point. We're just gonna pick the point that when I add it into my representation leads to the smallest MMD. So it's really just a greedy optimization of the special sort of MMD. And in particular, after I've picked S points, I may have picked the same point more than once, that can happen. But in the worst case, the running time is gonna be NS squared. So if I care about that heavy compression setting, that's gonna be N squared time, just like before. Okay, and what can we say about the quality of this result, of the resulting point set? Well, here's a result. And I think this is really interesting because First, the rate I'm going to show you on the I show you on the right is is no better than the IID rate, but now we're comparing to a much stronger benchmark, and this this result says that Stein thinning is nearly as good as the best simplex reweighting of your input points. All right, so before we were just saying we just want to be as good as the input points, but this is as you're as nearly as good as the best reweighting of your input points. So in particular, that means you're as good as the mark of chain with all of your burn-in removed, you know, um, because you could always just give weight zero to the burn-in points and give weight, you know, equal weight to the other points. And that's like one simplex reweighting of your points. And it also means that you, you can perform nearly as well as an off-target sample after you've done some sort of optimal important sampling reweighting. So this is perfect for a tempering setting or for other settings like approximate MCMC where you're just your, your chain is targeting the wrong distribution, um, but you'd like it to target P instead. In fact, we can there's, we have a result of that form, which says that even if you just took your, if you, even if you were just drawing points IID from the wrong distribution, if you drew them IID from P tilde, then under some mild conditions, which are standard important sampling type conditions, then if you do Stein thinning, um, the resulting, your Stein thinning result is going to converge to P. So if you do sign the thing on points that are sampled from the wrong distribution, your result is still going to converge to P. And the same thing is true if you um, uh, apply this to you know, sufficiently ergodic Markov chains targeting the wrong distribution. Okay, so let's see this in action. Let's try to use this first to correct for burn-in. So here's this Goodwin model that I mentioned earlier of enzymatic control. I'm showing you this trajectory. It's a four-dimensional model, but this is a two-dimensional projection of the Markov chain that we sampled, the gray points, or you know, points sampled. And even though there's this whole long loopy tail here, all of the action of this example is happening in this little box. This is where the posterior is. This is where the posterior concentrates its mass, but we started the chain over here. And so in this case, you know, about half of the points should be discarded due to burn. They have nothing to do with the distribution. And so the normal thing to do would be to run some sort of burn-in diagnostic to figure out where the burn-in level is and then throw away all those points. Typically that involves running multiple chains to do that, to just conduct the burn-in diagnostic. And that's what I did on the left-hand side. So burn-in diagnostic, throw away the burn-in and then use standard thinning to subsample the remaining points. Um, on the right, instead I just ran Stein thinning on the whole, on the whole chain. 
And what you see is that it's also picking points in the right region. It just gets rid of all the burden because, you know, because it knows something about P, it's comparing the points to P directly in terms of that kernel Stein discrepancy. All right, and so now if you actually look at the quality of these point sets, what you can see is so I've shown you in these plots, I'm showing you a few different quality measures on the, on the top, I'm showing you kernel Stein discrepancy. Um, so we'll start there. The colored curves represent different variants of, variants of Stein thinning with different kernels, basically. Um, the gray curves represent standard thinning and the black curve is another procedure called support points that also produces compressed representations. And what do we see here? We're basically seeing that Stein thinning is providing um, better approximation error than standard thinning, even after you do your burn-in correction. And you know, Stein thinning doesn't do, do burn-in correct, or rather, Stein thinning takes care of the burn-in itself. And standard thinning requires like an outside extra step to remove burn-in. And that's in terms of the kernel Stein discrepancy. You know, the same conclusions hold in terms of another external metric called the energy distance, which is just another way of measuring probability. A divergence. And then on the right, I'm also showing you errors for individual parameters, um, you know, first moments for the, the four different parameters. Okay. Um, now that's correcting from burn-in. Let's talk about tempering. So we, we started all of this because I said our change didn't mix for the hinge example. So let's first check, and, and these are the, this is the plot I showed you before. This plot on the right is two independent Markov chains that didn't mix. Um, and you can tell that because the distributions are not even overlapping, the marginal distributions. So first, all I wanna highlight from the slide on the left is that when we do tempering, indeed the chains are mixing pretty well. We're getting pretty, you know, much closer approximations between the two different runs. Okay, so this is just, you know, to tell you that after tempering, the chains do mix, but of course now they're, they're mixing to the wrong distribution. They're mixing to P tilde, not P. And so what are, so, um, what I'm showing you in this plot is the quality that you get from Stein thinning versus other approaches you might take. So first, in black, I'm showing you, oh, sorry, uh, yes. In black, I'm showing you what happens if you just run um, support points, a standard compression algorithm on the, un on the sorry, the tempered distribution, on the untempered distribution. And this actually leads, leads to a bad approximation. This, this is a bad approximation just because, as I said before, the chains haven't mixed well. And so if you um, compress a bad approximation, it's also gonna be bad. Um, fine, so what you could do instead is you could use the tempered chains. You could do like run support points on um, the tempered chains, but don't do any bias correction or anything, just compress the tempered MCMC algorithms. If you do that, your approximation is even worse because the tempered distribution is actually far away from the true distribution. It, it doesn't, it's P tilde is not the same as P, and so you get an even worse approximation. But if you, if you use the temper chains as input to Stein thinning, which does bias correction automatically, then you get this improved approximation to P. You can measure that improved approximation to P. Okay, and that was our goal. So, some conclusions. So I introduced these two new tools for uh, compressing a probability distribution more effectively than IID sampling or standard MCMC thinning. I showed you kernel thinning, which takes an endpoint summary, compresses it down to square root endpoints with better than IID approximation error. And I showed you Stein thinning, which does, which simultaneously reduces bias while compressing. And this could be bias due to off-target sampling, tempering, or burn-in. And these I think are especially well-suited for tasks that have these substantial downstream computation costs. And if you wanna learn more about either of these, uh, I have some pointers here to papers and, um, and code. And before I, before I stop talking though, I want to highlight a couple of interesting things that we've been doing since the work that I just presented. Um, and the answer, they might answer some of the questions you might have. Like for instance, do you really need the square root kernel in this algorithm, in this kernel thinning algorithm? And so we've, we've been wondering this too, and we've been investigating this a bit, and we found a few things. So first, if you, instead of the square root kernel, you just use the target kernel everywhere in the algorithm, then for analytic kernels, like Gaussian, inverse multi-quadrate, and stink, you can actually get similar, or in some cases, better MMD guarantees just by using the original kernel. And on top of that, you can get these dimension-free single function integration error guarantees. So for every function in your RKHS, 
you can, you can show that your approximation for that function is sub Gaussian with square root log n over n error, which you should compare to n to the minus one quarter if you were just doing IID sampling. Second, um, for non-smooth kernels that don't actually have a square root, you can actually use a, a fractional power kernel, a kernel that's basically in between a square root and your target. And this leads to improved MMD guarantees. This is useful for return kernels and Laplace kernels. And then if you add together the target kernel with your fractional kernel, then you get all of these guarantees simultaneously. So you get like the improved single function integration error, as well as the better MMD get bounds. And we call that kernel thinning plus. And then, okay, one last question that I want to answer <laughs> preemptively. Um, can you speed these algorithms up without ruining, their, without ruining their quality? So I mentioned both the algorithms that I presented are n squared time. Can you do, can you do this faster than n squared time? And we've been exploring that as well. And we have um, a simple meta algorithm that takes in um, your slow algorithm and makes it faster. So for instance, if your, if your algorithm runs in quadratic time, it reduces the time to n log squared n, but it doesn't without, and you know, with error guarantees. So, you know, it inflates the error by most a factor of four. Um, and here are some example plots. Here are the same sorts of, uh, you know, increasing dimension plots that I showed you earlier. And you should compare the green lines with the blue line. The green line is kernel thinning and the blue line is this compressed, this faster version of kernel thinning where it can now run to like much larger input sizes easily. And you can see that, for instance, if you want to run kernel thinning in um, dimension 100 uh, with size, what is this, 25,000, um, no, 250,000, input size 250,000, then it would take you about 32 hours to run. But you can get that down to one hour without sacrificing really anything in your computate in, the, in, in terms of error. So that's a 32 x speed up, and that's just coming from going from n squared down to n log, log squared n. And you can run the same, the same procedure on your favorite thinning algorithm. So it doesn't have to be kernel thinning. Like you could plug in another standard procedure like kernel herding, which is what I did here. And you get the same sorts of plots. In some cases we're getting 60 X speed ups. And strangely enough, in smaller dimensions, we act, you can actually improve upon the error of the original algorithm via this meta procedure. Okay, so I'll just leave you there with, um, I'll ask your questions and thank you for your, all your time. All right. Uh, thank you, Lester. I am uh, leading the question session. So, um, oh, I see David has a hand raised. So let me call on him first. So uh, thank you. This was great. Um, I actually have uh, two questions and you can pick which one you want to uh, answer and I'm happy to move on if there's uh, if there's other people. So the first one is uh, most of the kernels that you described have hyperparameters associated with them in particular length scales. How do you choose that? And the, the second one is uh, you, uh, you were almost exclusively thinking about uh, methods in which uh, you were doing corset-based thinning, so there was no weighting uh, on anything except for this mention that uh, you get close to the optimal uh, weighted version over all of your nodes. But I, I, I wonder in particular with the first part, just the kernel thinning before the, the Stein piece, um, whether there's any advantage to be gained by considering uh, weighted versions as well. Sure. Okay. Both great questions. You know, let's start with the second one because you now it's fresh in my memory. <laughs> um, the weighting. So yeah, so we wanted an algorithm that would work even if you couldn't support, if for downstream weapons applications that didn't support weighting, but if you can support weighting, then you can just add weights on top. In fact, it's really easy to find the optimal weights for MMD. You just solve a quadratic program and you can do that in like n to the three halves time. Once you've done your compression, you can do that in n to three halves time on those like square root endpoints, and so that's very easy to do. And yes, yeah, so you'll just it can only improve your quality. Um, and so if if you can support weighting, then I would say do that, add weights to these points, and you'll get an even better approximation. And then the 
the first question, uh, remind me what that was again? Uh, the kernel length scales. Oh yeah, the kernel length scales. So for all the experiments, we use basically what's called a median heuristic, um, which is to set the length scale to the median pairwise distance um, between the, the points, your input points. Um, that's just a heuristic. Here, we're not really make, trying to make any, we're not trying to um, suggest any particular kernel, rather we're trying to produce an algorithm that will work for whatever kernel that you want to use. And so different kernels are used in different applications. There are different settings of length scales that are appropriate for different applications. Um, but yeah, for all these experiments, we just pick them basically using this median heuristic, which for something like our Gaussian setup means um, the bandwidth is like square root 2D. Perfect, thanks. Lionel wrote a question in the chat and I'm wondering, oh, uh, Lester, do you wanna oh, should open it up. address Lionel's question? <laughs> let's see, let's see. Yeah, a different idea. Oh, while sorry. you're opening the chat, I'll just preface it by saying, if I understood your methods right, they all involve taking a subset of the original sample points. And I'm wondering if you can improve performance by taking a smaller set of points that isn't necessarily a subset. And one idea for that would be taking points where the first few moments match the moments of your full distribution. Okay, great. So, okay, so two pieces there. Um, can you do better by picking points that are not your original points? The answer is definitely yes. I mean, you can only you can only do better. It's less constrained, so it's definitely yes. And I think in some cases you should be able to do much better. We haven't explored that yet, but I think I mean I think that's a great idea. So constrain you know if there are no other reasons to constrain yourself, like some cases there might be, but like there are other statistics that you've computed for those points that you don't want to recompute, like along the way from your Markov chain algorithm. Um, so you know, for instance, in Stein thinning, you need to know not just the point, but you need to know the gradient of the log density at that point. And if you're already running the metropolis adjusted lender an algorithm, then you already have that gradient of that log density because you used it to sample the point initially. And so then, you know, you don't need to recompute it, but you would need to recompute if you used other points. So there's some cases where you might not want to, but otherwise, if you're not constrained in that way, then allowing yourself to pick other points, I think could be great. And then there's, yeah, of course, the question of like, how do you pick those points? And then you mentioned taking the S points whose first S moments match the full sample. So can you describe, maybe you can say in more detail, like how, how you're imagining picking those? Right, so imagine that your function f, whose expectation you wanna compute is a low degree polynomial. In that case, if the moments of your subsample match the moments of the full sample, then you'll get exact agreement. And since, you know, continuous functions can be approximated by polynomials, you might expect that if you were able to find uh, points whose moments match your full sample, that that would perform well. What I'm not sure about is how to find those points, you know, whether that's computationally feasible. So it's definitely, so it is feasible to get at least a good approximation to that. Because for instance, you could choose your kernel to be like a polynomial kernel, which is really just looking at differences in the first, you know, S moments. And then you could like even run, you could even run the same algorithm. You could even run like this kernel thinning algorithm um, to find a good set of points with, with, in, in that regard. So like that's completely, that's completely feasible. We've been focusing mostly on infinite dimensional kernels, um, but you could do the same sort of thing with a finite dimensional kernel, especially, especially if you knew that you really just cared about a certain number of moments or like a, a particular polynomial with a certain degree. And that I think makes a lot of sense. I was curious if you had any uh, hypothetical explanation for the mysterious improvement in MMD in low dimensions when you do the uh, compression scheme on the slide. Hmm. Well, it might be, so herding is basically um, a greedy algorithm. It's a deterministic greedy algorithm. And what we're doing with this, out, with this um, compressed plus plus that I never described to you is doing is it's um, 
only it's using it to have it's using herding to have so you take you pass in an input point set of size n and you get that n over two and you do it for different sizes and then every time you get that half back you um symmetrize it randomly so you either pick the half you know you either pick that half or you pick the other half with equal probability and then you basically sum together all these different halves in the right way and then you, you get out the course out of your your target size so you might actually be gaining from that extra independence um um, that extra randomization that you're doing every step, that, that might be the reason, but I'm not, I haven't tested that hypothesis. <laughs> I see. Thanks. Does anyone else want to, ah, Sloan, you want to unmute and ask your question? Maybe, okay. maybe I'll read out Sloan's question. This Colonel Stein method is very interesting. Do you know of any similar results for other statistical distances or divergences beyond MMDs? Well, um, so I um, there and actually, are actually while you're answering, <laughs> Zhongxin asked, does it make sense to consider any different IPM instead of MMD, which seems like a closely related question. So maybe I'll put both of them to you as a pair. Yeah. Uh, so from the from the kernel from the Stein discrepancy side, um, I have worked on developing other Stein discrepancies that are not MMDs. Um, I think I haven't tried optimizing them. So like one nice thing about the MMDs is it's pretty easy to optimize, um, in part because of its closed form representation. But it actually might not be too difficult to optimize others. So we have a like a, another family of Stein discrepancies called Graph Stein discrepancies, which have the same property that you can actually compute them even though you don't know how to integrate under P. And um, you can imagine optimizing that. Instead, they're much stronger distance metrics than MMDs. They're like, they, they represent IPMs over much larger function classes. So I haven't either tried, tried them out computationally for the optimization point or tried analyzing them in this way. But um, it's, it, seems, it seems possible. And it makes sense that you would consider other divergences as well. And so this, this Stein discrepancy idea you could actually apply to really any sort of IPM, but the key is to build, to actually make what the, the output computable. So the other thing that's often not computable about an IPM is that you're taking this supremum over an infinite class of functions. And so there's some infinite classes of functions that we know how to compute the supremum of. MMDs, we know how to do it for, we know how to do it for these graph Stein discrepancies. And so you'd have to, you'd have to find another class for which you could like easily compute that supremum in order just to make the, uh, the metric computable or optimizable. Um, and now in terms of just considering different IPMs, I think, um, certainly, I mean, yeah, so that's very related. I'm, I'm in no way tied to MMD. I started here because this is a place where a lot of past compression algorithms have already focused their efforts. So kernel herding was for MMDs, um, support points are for MMDs, even quasi Monte Carlo gives you guarantees for the L2 discrepancy, which is an MMD. So it seems like a, a nice class to work with for starting point, but controlling, the, doing compression for other metrics, particularly metrics that are more targeted to your downstream tasks, I think um, makes a lot of sense. Thank you.